Good evening. My name is Bob Hauser, and I'm the executive officer of the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to this public keynote session of the Society's virtual November meeting. I'm glad that you've uh, joined us this evening. Because this is a unique public session, and some of you may not be familiar with the Society, I will say more about it than would be usual at a meeting of the Society. But first this, the American Philosophical Society acknowledges with respect that it resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people whose historical relationships with this land continue to this day. We recognize their continued presence and perseverance despite centuries of land theft, removal and persecution of their language and cultural traditions. The APS expresses its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals who have offered their guidance, expertise, and opportunities for collaboration. The society honors the Lenape community and those of other native peoples through our collections, fellowships, research awards, and outreach activities. For those of you joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743 with the mission of promoting useful knowledge. Most of our nation's founders were members and the APS had Thomas Jefferson as its president for 17 years, during most of which he was either vice president or president of the United States. Like the constitution, the presidency, the Congress, and the courts. As a source and keeper of knowledge, the society was an essential piece of the bedrock on which our nation was founded almost 250 years ago. It remains so today. While we at the society continue to admire Franklin and Jefferson and other founding members for their key roles in the formation of our nation, for their leadership of the society, and for their devotion to science, education, and other noble causes. We are also much aware of their faults, most significantly their slaveholding. We at the APS are committed to sustaining the better parts of their legacy while working toward a future of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, the APS IDEA, I-D-E-A. The society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who have made exceptionally significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities and public life. The society promotes useful knowledge, its original and continuing mission by providing over a million and a half dollars of research grants and fellowships each year, primarily to those younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. The society sustains an informed citizenry. We do that through our meetings, influencing the influencers, as well as through publications, public lectures, and research support. Although our facilities remain physically closed to all but staff and fellows, we remain committed to serving our mission of promoting useful knowledge. Please check the events link on the APS website, www.amphilsoch.org, both for our traditional offerings and for news of forthcoming virtual events. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker and my good friend, Professor Lawrence Bobo, the W.E.B. Du Bois Professor of the Social Sciences and Dean of Social Science at Harvard University. He also holds the, the highly distinguished title of Harvard College Professor with joint appointments in the departments of sociology and African and African American studies. Among other honors, he was elected a member of the American Philosophical Society in 2008. And he's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences. Larry and I have known one another since the mid 1980s when we were at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and we labored in tandem on the National Academy of Sciences well-known report, A Common Destiny, Blacks in American Society. Dr. Bobo's research fo focuses on the intersection of social psychology, 
social inequality, politics, and race. A prolific author, editor, and media commentator, he is among numerous other roles editor of the Du Bois Review, and he is currently working on the Race, Crime, and Public Opinion Project. Professor Bobo's address is entitled, A Failure to Heal, Race and Politics in the United States. Dr. Bobo. Thank you so much, Bob, for that warm and, and overly detailed uh, introduction. It's very good to be with you again. I'd like to thank you and Linda Greenhouse and the other members of the APS for both inviting me to uh, deliver this address and to uh, join you in this virtual session this evening. One of the important choices I had to make here was whether or not to um, attempt to provide uh, PowerPoint slides. And I've decided that in an era where so many of us are tied to our uh, computer monitors that I'm going to have a PowerPoint free evening for you. And hopefully that lets you really wrestle with um, the argument I'm, and ideas I'm, I'm trying to put forward and not be distracted by uh, terms, phrases, or pictures that I've put before you on the screen. So uh, with that preamble out of the way, uh, let me begin. Many great thinkers have engaged the problem of race in American society, politics, and culture. From Thomas Jefferson and Alexis de Tocqueville, to Gunnar Myrdal, Martin Luther King, and John Hope Franklin, to such present day scholars as William Julius Wilson, Claude Steele, and Mazarin Banaji. Entering this arena with the aspiration of casting at least useful, if not altogether new light on such carefully and thoroughly trod terrain is no easy task. Yet, I believe our times require of us careful reflection on why race has been and still is such a fraught and obdurate divide in the United States, especially in our contemporary politics. The presidential election season of 2020, still not fully and finally concluded, even as we gather this evening, has been suffused with many great anxieties. Anxieties about the basic physical health and well being of the nation in the light of a second surge in, COVID in the COVID 19 pandemic. Anxieties about the economy and the millions of Americans still facing employment uncertainty and the risk of eviction. Anxieties about the rekindling of a powerful racial justice movement and attendant mass protest and sometimes disorder in our cities. And anxieties about the future of American democracy itself as the power of an imperial presidency and the numerous violation of norms of democratic governance that we had come to take for granted and that seemed to define the American experience fall into question. On its own terms, and with regard to COVID-19, the economy and the future of democratic governance, race and the racial divide are ever present considerations complicating and intertwining with all of these matters. Within the social sciences and humanities, the diagnoses of our current condition along the racial divide run the gamut. At one extreme stand racial pessimists who embrace some variant of the position that racism and white supremacy are defining and eradicable features of American society. At the other extreme are those who assess that racism uh, and white supremacy, if not yet totally overcome, are in steady and inexorable decline. As with so many areas of scholarly discourse, there are plenty of views uh, in the middle espousing a more ambivalent posture. This, to be fair and clear, is where I stand, much like a physician observing a patient whose injuries have surely not yet healed, but who could well be on a path to complete recovery. I engage this question, this task of societal, political, and cultural diagnosis, mainly as a sociological social psychologist, as Bob just mentioned. My own principal tool of investigation over the years of my career has been the large scale sample survey, what is more colloquially known as the public opinion poll. Though there are good reasons to try to attempt to preserve a meaningful distinction between polls on one hand and surveys on the other, 
varying as they often do in scope, depth, design, and various implementation features. Likewise, it would be wise to bear in mind the limitations of the tool, perhaps especially in the current moment of concern that the polls have failed us once again, and in the light of other uh, intellectual gaps in the work in this arena. Nonetheless, anyone serious about understanding American history and its development must, simply must come to grips with the problem of race and racial division. For this reason, distinguished historian Winthrop Jordan in his Bancroft Prize and National Book Award winning work, White Over Black, American Attitudes Toward the Negro, wrote that he wished he could have been in Jamestown, Virginia in 1619 with, quote, questionnaire in hand, as the first 20 Negars, as the term then put it, arrived in what would become the US. It seemed evident to him that one really had to understand the attitudes and beliefs about race actors held in those times if one had a hope of making full sense of events in the nation as they subsequently unfolded. But of course, Jordan had no time machine and could not go back to the past for such an undertaking. Modern social scientists, however, are fortunate to have available to them systematic uh, repeated social surveys that provide an unusually powerful tool for assessing change in our social and cultural fabric. A remarkable attitudinal record on race from two major ongoing social science endeavors, one called the General Social Survey, long conducted at the University of Chicago's NORC and used mainly by sociologists, and the National Election Study, long conducted at the University of Michigan's Institute for Social Research and used principally by political science scientists, as well as several of the more ambitious commercial and media social polls, now provide a rich and complex resource base for examining the nature of and patterns of change in racial attitudes and beliefs. Unlike even the most probing ethnography or handful of in-depth interviews, or the most complex and meticulously designed laboratory experiments, surveys are able to represent large and important population groups and do so in a fashion that has long facilitated rich and varied, even if highly structured, conversations at random, as Gene Converse once put it, lend themselves to producing data that we can bring rigorous multivariate analyses and hypothesis testing strategies to and provide the basis for an accumulation of information and knowledge. In saying all this, I make no special claim to pure objectivity that of course uh, does not exist, but it is a method that leads to a certain level of transparency, replicability, and for our purposes, a capacity to study social change. My aim this evening is to use this body of information and research in which I've been toiling for so long to address by way of a quite imperfect, but I hope useful medical um, analogy or metaphor. That medical analogy entails a diagnosis of how our nation and contemporary politics have responded to the profound wound in our body politic inflicted by our grievous error in having institutionalized race-based slavery for well over 200 years. An error and wound that was followed with the pain attendant to another near century of Jim Crow de jure segregation and discrimination. The latter then slowly yielded to many years of intense struggles and contestation, many of which continue today, over whether we would be a genuinely plural, multicultural and race aware nation or instead be a singular, potentially quite unequal, but monolithic, profoundly colorblind nation. What then does this lexicon of medicine and wound healing do for us? What leverage, if any, does it give us? I think it focuses us on thinking in terms of major stages to a process of change and improvement and healing. It also calls to mind different dynamics and contexts of action at each distinct stage that are important to the potential for the success of the next stage of transformation and healing. The medical sciences tell us that serious wounds on the course toward healing progress through four pretty uniform stages, 
The first is called hemiostasis, in which the blood loss caused by a wound is stopped. The bleeding is staunched. For brevity's sake, I will view this stage as involving the end of the importation of slaves to the US with its ban in 1808. The second stage of wound healing is known as inflammation, wherein the wound swells up, often turns red, and is a source of considerable pain as the body strives to control any remaining bleeding and to ward off infection. This stage, uh, we can, for my purposes tonight, think of as stretching from the Civil War years through the first Reconstruction, 1865 through 1876-77, and second Reconstruction, which will close with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 both of which combined along with the Brown decision in 1954 to bring Jim Crow or de jure segregation and discrimination to an end and pass on to African-Americans full basic citizenship rights. We are arguably then entering or still in process of the third stage, though I can appreciate that the case can be made for not yet moving beyond this second stage, but bear with me for now. This third stage is called proliferation in which a wound is steadily being rebuilt with new collagen, new blood vessels, new networks uh, in the system being established. A final stage, and for the purposes uh, this evening I regard as an aspirational goal, is that of what's called maturation or remodeling. Herein, a wound finally fully closes, and in the case of more minor wounds, the tissue is restored to something very close to its original state before the infliction of an injury. In the case of a more serious injury, of course, the area around the wound is not likely to heal 100%, but it can mend to a very substantial healthy degree. In this age of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is perhaps easy to understand how we have all become preoccupied with medicine, the medical and illness as lenses through which to view much of what is happening around us, perhaps particularly me, <laughs> I am drawn to this illness-related medical or wound healing analogy in part because I have heard and been involved in too many discussions, including those involving quite serious discussers, the serious scholars engaged in important inquiry and deliberation, where someone has declared that, quote, nothing has really changed nothing meaningful has changed or probably will ever change about race in the US. While I am no Pollyanna optimist, careful reflection on the now, let's say delimited scope of the 80 year history of systematic social surveys on race, I think um, the record here leads uh, to the conclusion that we are much further along in a healing process than such a declaration recognizes or acknowledges, though in the same breath, I'm conceding that the pace of positive change is all too slow and that achieving the full genuine healing or maturation and remodeling stage is by no means assured. Yet, as historian George Fredrickson observed, quote, the responsibility of the historian or sociologist who studies racism is not to moralize and condemn but to understand this malignancy so that it can be more effectively treated, just as a medical researcher studying cancer does not moralize about it, but searches for knowledge that might point the way to a cure. Where race and politics connect, it is easy and very tempting to become exuberantly optimistic, as happened in 2008, when Barack Obama was elected as the first African-American president of the United States or to become excessively pessimistic, as has been true of the mood in many quarters since Donald Trump was elected in 2016. As we are whipsawed from the great hope of Barack Obama in 2008, and what many literally hailed as America's post-racial moment, to the victory of Donald Trump in 2016, and the near complete disappearance and erasure of post-racial discourse it is wise, I submit, to think with care about what is actually taking place and deep careful scrutiny with regard to racial analyses. Let me turn to some conceptual groundwork here. 
Before discussing my assessment of the attitudinal record and before directly answering the question of whether or to what extent the US has a failure to meaningfully heal the wounds of race, let me start with two conceptual points about racial attitudes and notions of prejudice or intolerance. We tend to think, especially uh, uh, in lay terms, of ethnic or racial prejudice as lying along a single continuum. This continuum running from hostility, dislike and antagonism at one extreme to incomity, liking and harmony at the other end. Now it is true that eminent social psychologist Gordon W. Alport defined prejudice as quote, an antipathy based upon a faulty and inflexible generalization. It may be felt or expressed. It may be directed toward a group as a whole or toward an individual because he is a member of a group, end quote. Alport nonetheless adopted a quite internally complex and nuanced view of the nature of prejudice. Accordingly, attitudes and belief with regard to race are indeed complex. Whether our gaze is directed at a societal level analysis within particular communities or organizations, or even at the level of the individual and his or her personal psychology. This point is important because much of the case for the more pessimistic view about the state of race relation requires summary dismissal of the import or meaning of the results of many types of racial attitude measurement and the singular focus on one's preferred indicator or measure, such as potentially the degree of wealth inequality or rates of incarceration, or most prominently today perhaps, police shootings of unarmed African-American civilians as the one or key uh, collective yardstick that matters most. It is hard to engage these issues without considering how best also to understand and use the concept of racism. It is at once an indispensable term in diagnosing American society and politics, but it is also a term that has been too casually, unreflectively and imprecisely used both within and outside the academy. The most useful definition of racism or of racist ideology that I have found comes from the work of William Julius Wilson. He suggested that racism, quote, is an ideology of racial domination or exploitation that one, incorporates beliefs in a particular race's cultural and or inherent biological inferiority, and two, uses such beliefs to justify and prescribe inferior treatment for that group. Accordingly, it is a set of ideas or beliefs about durable patterns of difference between groups along socially valued traits, statuses, and behaviors. It can and often involves reference to differences in nature or biology, but may also, I submit, involve reference to presumably deeply rooted and only slowly changing cultural patterns of outlook, belief, and behavior. Quickly stated, my first substantive claim is that in the post-World War II period, uh, we saw the social organization and ideology of race in the US shift from a state of Jim Crow racism to one that I label as now involving laissez-faire racism, or perhaps as I'm sometimes toying with neoliberal racism. That shift involves a move of some considerable significance and could be viewed through the medical analogy for the moment as a step forward uh, in the healing of the wound. Let me elaborate on the nature and basis of this claim. <clears throat> Foundational major surveys on race began as the US started its involvement in World War II with key baseline surveys being done in 1942, 1944, and 1946. This was a time when most African Americans were still in the South and where Jim Crow laws, practices, and outlooks still held unambiguous sway. In characterizing the black image in the white mind at the dawn of the 20th century, George Fredrickson identified six elements of then dominant social thought. He pointed to widespread acceptance among white Americans of the idea that blacks were different from and inferior to whites and that such differences could not be quickly or easily changed. Accordingly, the idea of race mixing and intermarriage was to be avoided at all costs. Hostility to or prejudice 
by whites against blacks was presumed to be natural and inevitable. And indeed notions of biracial equality and, and civic equality were simply inconceivable. That was Jim Crow. The first major national survey on race that, that became the baseline for the work in this arena, as I said, took place in 1942, conducted by what was then called the Office of War Information, a US government agency. On a number of critical issues, it yielded evidence of a national consensus among white Americans in support of the elements of Jim Crow racist ideology. Some 68% of white Americans uh, affirmed the idea that our schools should be racially segregated. Some 54% uh, at the time affirmed the idea that public transportation should be segregated. <clears throat> and 55% thought that uh, white Americans should receive preference in access to jobs and employment. These results and many others are reported in a book I co-authored with my mentor, Howard Schumann and Charlotte Stee in 1985 called Racial Attitudes in America, Trends and Interpretation. Now in that work, we divided the available data into three major categories, principles or the abstract ideals that ought to guide black white relations, implementation or public policy, the things that government should or shouldn't do to bring about greater racial equality and integration and equal treatment, and thirdly, social distance, the degree to which individuals were willing to enter uh, racially integrated situations of different context and uh, mixture. What we find on the whole is an enormous positive normative transformation with regard to race. We find in effect a repudiation of Jim Crow ideology so that the endorsement of school segregation becomes the endorsement overwhelmingly of the idea that our schools, at least in principle, ought to be integrated. Endorsement of the idea of white preference and access to jobs and of segregation of public transportation show such rapid and sweeping change that they literally dropped from major uh, national surveys by the early 1970s. If one were to look at this domain of social distance, entrance into hypothetical context and situations of varying levels of integration, uh, we find that superficial numbers of African-Americans come to be uh, welcomed into schools, neighborhoods, workplaces, uh, with virtually no uh, levels of objection, again, by the late 1970s. If one looked at the larger context in which blacks might become half or a majority of those in a school or a neighborhood, there were substantial signs of resistance among white Americans, even comparatively recently to entering such contexts. In the policy domain, there was long been much less uh, support for a strong activist government in assuring uh, racial equality unless the nature of that equality involved um, a highly public sphere of life, such as access to hotels and restaurants or in public transportation. If it involved access to jobs, access to um, higher education, uh, other efforts to aggressively reduce inequality, there was deep skepticism that surveys have always shown since uh, at least the mid 1960s, and particularly so for any strong version of affirmative action as questions were increasingly asked about that subject uh, beginning in the mid uh, 1970s. So we emphasized a huge normative change in repudiation of the principles that undergirded Jim Crow racism, but recognition of a principle implementation gap that while people were no longer ready to advocate for a social order that was de jure segregated and discriminatory as the principle or goal, they were far from ready to see government take profound steps toward undoing uh, racial inequality. The second point I want to make here is that as we witness the kind of institutional decline of Jim Crow racism as brought about by the Brown v. Board decision, the 64 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Civil Rights Act and other related legislation on housing as late as 1968, um, we also saw the decline of popular endorsement of and intellectual investment in the ideology of Jim Crow. What happened in its place? I argue that we've seen the emergence of a new form of racism that I call laissez-faire racism. 
This is an outlook that um, suggests that uh, government has no strong obligation or duty to undo racial inequality, that that lack of a positive duty in part rests on the belief that African Americans and their own behavior patterns and culture are primary, res primarily responsible for ongoing racial inequality. And that is tethered to a strong sense of uh, antagonism or resentment as African Americans and members of other minority groups press demands on society to redress longstanding um, inequalities and sense of grievance and unfair treatment. And there's lots of evidence to support that view. First and foremost, the clarity of the principal implementation gap, which has really undergone very little change. There's a good news story there in that we, despite much discussion of backlash in the 60s and 70s, there was no return toward endorsement of segregationist Jim Crow principles. On the downside, however, uh, there's never been an extremely strong embrace for a powerful activist government role in uh, undoing racial uh, inequality, a point I will complicate um, a little further down, down the road. One thing that has endured, but it's changed in character, are negative stereotypes about African-Americans and other people of color. Um, and I won't go through the full legacy of, of uh, the research here, but um, those stereotypes were found to continue but they have two features that distinguish them from the early parts of the Jim Crow era. Rather than being categorical uh, judgments about inherent biological difference between blacks and whites, they're more qualitative or gradational judgments of a cultural nature, that blacks don't exert the same level of effort to achieve and better themselves, a kind of outlook we recently saw uh, endorsed by Jared Kushner in some of his public remarks. Um, that set of stereotypings, uh, stereotypes remains powerfully there. It is a strong underpinning of the resistance to a more activist government engagement uh, in social change. In addition, we've also seen extraordinary hostility uh, in the past, and I'm gonna complicate this even further in a moment, to strong black activism demanding and pushing for change with those things having real political resonance and punch. Let's leap ahead uh, uh, to something closer to the current moment. A core feature of our current political environment that I wish to emphasize is the friction that grows out of the joint occurrence of rising economic inequality and vulnerability for much of our population at the same time that we have witnessed a sizable and increasing ethno-racial diversification of the US population. That has bred a circumstance in which um, we see the kind of racial polarization that worked well for um, the Trump candidacy. What's the context? For most of the period from 1945 to 1973, as our economy grew, Incomes grew for everyone, and the income gap between the most affluent and the least affluent in the US actually shrank. A quite different story has characterized the post-1973 period, particularly the post-1980 era. Since the Great Recession, a disproportionate share of income and wealth has gone upward to the already most well-off segments of the population. Um, at the same moment, we've witnessed a sharp rise in the share of the population coming from Asia and Latin America, as well as from other parts of the globe, including Africa. Figures by Brookings Institution senior fellow William Fry have shown that 64% of the US population could be classified as white in 2010. Between 2010 and 2050, that percentage is expected to steadily decline with the United States probably becoming a majority minority population by 2040. In fact, we hit one important benchmark six years ago when the majority of new births in this country were children of color. Experimental research shows that when presented with evidence of these demographic trends, many white Americans tend to express a sense of threat from minorities and a greater emotional animosity toward them. 
they also begin to think even more than they may already have in very zero sum terms about opportunities and resources. Moreover, there's some experimental work showing that drawing attention to these demographic terms have direct political effects. Social psychologists Maureen Craig and Jennifer Richardson found that experimentally manipulating awareness of this racial population shift increases white identification with conservative political ideology and the Republican Party. Circa 2016, enter Donald Trump. It should surprise no one that this nexus of conditions, sharply rising inequality and an increasingly acute sense of economic vulnerability for lower and middle income Americans in the context of rapid population change as we transition from a solid majority white population to a nation with a clear, without a clear ethno-racial dominant group opens the door to powerfully resonant blend of anti-minority populism, an important development. Now, this is not to say that that's the sole factor that drove the outcome of the 2016 election for, um, as we know, uh, there were active minority vote suppression efforts. There was no doubt a strong strand of misogyny against uh, Hillary Clinton. And there was a great deal of interference from Russia and potentially other outside sources in our electoral processes as well. But I believe it is that context that really laid the groundwork for the Trump candidacy and contributed to his success at mobilizing uh, racial tensions uh, and both gaining the Republican nomination and ultimately uh, the White House, which in some ways could be viewed as the political consolidation of the laissez-faire racism regime. I want to suggest to you, however, that in the current electoral contest, context, there are some grounds for optimism, but we don't want to exaggerate them. We want to keep them in balanced perspective. What is the prognosis then uh, for further progress in healing wounds of race? There are several features of the current national election results that augur well for the future of the racial divide. First and foremost, the most divisive American president since Woodrow Wilson, and perhaps arguably ever, has been fired by a clear majority of the American people. And despite uh, the senseless litigation and chicanery, that is holding up formal recognition of this outcome. The fear was real that his grip on a wide enough segment of American voters was sufficient to secure his reelection, but one can take heart that a deep and broad mobilization occurred that yielded a more sanguine outcome with regard to matters of race and racial division in the Biden-Harris tickets victory over Trump-Pence. A feature of this victory not to be shortchanged or glossed over is the fact that the ticket included a woman, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, who is of Afro-Asian American heritage, thus shattering at once multiple glass ceilings. Second, exit polls signal several other trends that may well tell of sanguine changes about the racial divide in the US. To be sure, the overall vote, as it has been in most elections within living memory, was racially polarized. 58% of white Americans voted for Trump whereas solid majorities of Latinx and Asian American voters cast ballots for Biden, 65% and 61% uh, percent respectively, according to exit poll ex estimates, and a super majority of 87% of African Americans did so. I have referred <clears throat> to this pattern in the past as the Obama coalition, consisting of a multiracial collection of slightly more than two out of five white voters, two out of three Latinx and Asian voters, and about nine out of 10 African-American voters. This coalition is slightly better educated, more likely to come from the Eastern Seaboard and Western states, composed of union household members and slightly higher income groups. Third, and particularly encouraging, racial issues and tensions were highly visible and directly salient in this election and engaged as such by the victorious candidates, yet it did not spoil their chances of victory and for advancing a more race conscious progressive agenda. We may well have experienced a collective social epiphany in the wake of the murders of Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, 
and all too many other African Americans uh, that then we have time to name here this evening. Exit poll results show, in fact, that some 53% of those who cast votes said the criminal justice system treats Blacks unfairly, with those holding this view substantially more likely to vote Biden-Harris. Likewise, 57% of voters expressed an overall favorable opinion of the Black Lives Matter movement. And a remarkable 69% of voters said that racism in the US is either one of or the single most important problem facing the nation. Indeed, that 20% of the electorate, one in five, who view racial inequality as the single most important issue facing the, the nation, fully 92% of them voted for Biden over Trump. <clears throat> this is fertile ground for pushing a new shared collective understanding of the racial divide in America. Fairness, accuracy requires, however, that I acknowledge, acknowledge several less than sanguine trends. Again, the most obvious of which is the large number of voters who supported a president who was the most prominent birther during the Obama presidency, who referred to Mexicans as murders and rapists, who called for a Muslim ban, who pardoned Joe Arpaio, <coughs> who was convicted by his own local courts of racial profiling, who referred to African nations as blank whole countries, who could not consistently criticize those who led an openly anti-Semitic, anti-Black march in Charlotte, North Carolina, and so much more. Among the potentially worrying features of these voters about the future is the high fraction of whom are white evangelical Christians. White evangelicals are about 28% or just under a third of the voting age population. And exit polls indicate that some 76% of them voted for Trump. More pretentious than this, however, are the high fractions of younger white voters who sided with Trump Prince over Biden Harris. Exit poll results indicate that young white voters who were between the ages of <clears throat> 14 and 25 when Trump first assumed office a full 53% of them voted for Trump. Similarly, among those who were 26 to 40 years of age when Trump first assumed office in 2016, a full 57% voted for Trump. Arguably, this is a dis <clears throat> disappointingly high fraction of those who have experienced important political socialization during this Trump era of divisiveness and openly race-laden appeals, and may signal that they are susceptible to carrying uh, this message of uh, returning to an older, idyllic America of comfortable white advantage, privilege, and dominance. And worthy of deeper explanation, <clears throat> exploration than I can provide here and now was Trump's curious success in appealing to black male voters, some 19% of whom supported him. I read these several patterns as signs that could <clears throat> weaken some of the prospects for healing the wounds of race. Let me now conclude. Well, good doctor, do we as a nation find that the terrible wound of slavery and attendant racism to now be securely on the mend or do we confront an ongoing failure to heal? <clears throat> I submit there is some value in viewing an answer to this question through the lens of the wound healing process. The experience of the original profound injury given its magnitude and longevity cannot be wholly undone or erased. But even as far back as the Constitutional Convention, there were voices that recognized the deep gaping contradiction between having just waged a revolution and fought a war for freedom and a new form of government, <clears throat> and yet embracing a, a new nation that treated fellow human beings as slaves and as a protected form of property in its founding documents. <clears throat> Indeed, Benjamin Franklin, a founder of this organization, was one voicing such a view at the Constitutional Convention. The troublesome nature of this Constitution was evident enough that, in fact, a sunset on the future importation of slaves, transatlantic trafficking, and people and property was adopted. And arguably, we know historically the institution of slavery withered in states above the Mason Dixon line. With that end to importation of new bodies from the African continent, <clears throat> and at least an implicit recognition of the moral costs of slavery, something akin to early stages of hemiostasis or the secession of the bleeding began. 
but the wound endured for long years and became increasingly inflamed as the nation struggled with uh, the terms under which new states would be admitted to the Union, whether they would be slave or free. As the vibrancy of the growing free labor market and industrializing sectors outside the agricultural South grew in importance, and as the growing chorus of voices, white and black, speaking loudly to the moral debasement of enslaving fellow human beings rose to prominence. We did eventually <clears throat> move in to the next stage of the healing process, particularly in the um, post-Civil War uh, through Second Reconstruction era. And we now move past that stage of inflammation. And I think stand squarely in the middle of the proliferation stage where some refashioning <clears throat> of the texture of the networks of the sinews with regard to the racial divide might conceivably take place. We still stand a long distance from that maturation or, or uh, quote, remod full remodeling stage. Racial change, positive change has been too slow. It's been too painful and necessitated conflict and steady political agitation. But if we are to make the change, that is the path we have to follow because things can move backward as some of those troublesome trends in the exit polls uh, imply may happen. We're at a new moment. We're hopefully at the dawn of a new era here. Uh, do we have a failure to heal? I think we're moving again in the direction of moving fully through that third stage of the healing process and with a capacity now to put our eye on that fourth stage of kind of full healing, reintegration and weaving of a complete seal of the old wounds of race and racial division in America. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bobo. This is uh, exactly the kind of thoughtful and thorough uh, discussion of our failure to heal that I was hoping that you might uh, might be able to present this evening. Um, let me uh, start um, with a a one a, one question uh, from Diane Ventus Venters. Uh, what, in your thinking, is the incentive for the dominant caste, that is white people, to extend a handout to people of color? Um, I think the uh, incentive is, in a way, uh, the collective betterment of us all. I think not doing so for most people in the fullness of time uh, weakens the whole in ways that really does... Um, disadvantage them. And it's not that we should have to hold out a material um, advantage, but I do indeed uh, believe that to be the case. Uh, there is uh, interesting work done by my colleague uh, here, economist Nathan Nunn, analyzing um, what has become the path of development in former slave states as compared to non-slaving states, especially if they enslaved you know their own citizens or people and uh, in general uh, there are just enduring lags and fissures that compromise the the economic and political success of such systems and I think a lot of what we're wrestling with today uh, is is um, uh, embodiment of exactly that that kind of, of failure to heal that that we would, uh, without doubt, collectively, uh, and in most instances, individually, be better off if we really moved uh, in that sort of direction. In the immediate short term, I see how it can be read as zero sum and a, a potential loss. Uh, but uh, I think uh, reflection, especially thinking through a longer scope, uh, we would see the benefits of it. I'm curious to know whether during the Trump administration itself, there have been any substantial shifts 
uh, in a negative direction uh, uh, in, 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 in the major uh, kind of uh, public opinion series that, that you have followed? Um, I have not yet observed any major negative shifts and some things continue to show at least small improvement. For example, we continue to see as some recent panel data analyses have shown um, uh, declining, continued decline in some negative stereotyping about African-Americans and um, other minorities. The real worrying trend here is that uh, over the period of uh, the 90s and, and early 2000s, we've seen an increasingly, an increasing polarization uh, in political party identification and its link to certain measures of resentment against African-Americans. So in particular, and you know, minority claims on society in general, so that, that it really is becoming a defining feature of our basic deeply institutionalized partisan alignments. And that is a very troubling development. And I think, unfortunately, it is one big element of how Trump was able to grab the hearts and minds of such a large swath of uh, the Republican base. And uh, unless real inroads are made there, we're in for a still long period of tension, struggle, and, and turmoil around that kind of divide. Uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Horowitz asks the following, the most disturbing result of the exit polls to him was the majority of young voters going for Trump. What do you think explains that? Um, I, uh, young white voters now. Oh. So um, I think I would at this point credit it to two things. One uh, is that coupling of rising economic insecurity and sense of vulnerability uh, in this era and a sense of um, a changing demographic makeup of the population and the energy and mobilization that is around things like now uh, Black Lives Matter uh, or DACA or uh, better treatment for immigrants. And these young people are of course asking themselves, where am I in this? And a candidate like Trump gives them a simple, an a simple answer. I wanna go back to a world in which you were the privileged, you were the high status and, and dominant group. And that is the, for me with regard to race, part of the dangerous moment in this era. Presidents exert, I think, an incredible influence over young people who are socialized during the era of their governance, of the messages that they send out, of the face and the language and the values that they bring to institutionalize government authority. And I read that as part of a big part of what's going on here. I, I recall that when Black Lives Matter uh, began as a kind of a theme, uh, that it was that it was a, a kind of marginal, and now it has really become central yes. in discussions yes. of race and politics and politics in the United States. And aside from the, is there something aside from these kind of highly publicized uh, police murders that has really put that into the forefront? Yes, a terrific question and something well worth uh, watching carefully. Um, I, I think it's the conjunction of these steady uh, uh, news coverage and now uh, really troubling uh, uh, but necessary video footage of the shootings of unarmed and often completely innocent African-American civilians and the just powerful, gut-wrenching death of uh, George Floyd um, are a big piece of this, that those things occurred in conjunction with the COVID-19 pandemic, something that we all thought would be a great equalizer, but turns out to be something that feeds into and amplifies existing race and class inequalities, um, that those two things together, um, along with other 
dramatic images like a, a, an American president who can't criticize white supremacists um, combined to create a sense that this really is a different moment calling for uh, a whole new take on this. In fact, I would speculate it cuts, uh, we don't have the evidence yet, but I, I speculate that it cuts deeper than the kind of experience that grew out of uh, John Lewis's uh, experience on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, where uh, peaceful black protesters were set upon by state troopers with um, clubs and, and dogs and the like, which was a profoundly transformative moment uh, in that era. I think this runs as deep, if not more, than that moment in galvanizing a new way of thinking about uh, uh, racial inequality. That is the police shootings, the pandemic and the racialized effects uh, of it and a, a openly uh, divisive president have combined to produce uh, the seeds of potentially potent social change. Um. Linda Greenhouse asks if there are other nations that might possibly serve as positive models for us as in the United States as we go forward. I am actually wrestling with that very good question intellectually all the time. And I, I kind of pose it, are there other nations we can look to, nations that have had histories of deep institutionalized racial inequality that have uh, achieved a greater degree of transformation. My own reading, which uh, is still all too preliminary, I can't speak with deep expertise here about developments in South Africa, developments in Brazil, to a degree developments in Cuba, um, um, all suggest that we have not yet seen a society kind of fully, completely undo deep, long institutionalized racial inequality and stigmatization of a segment of its population. Is that doesn't something? mean it's impossible, but it hasn't happened yet. Is there something particular that might be learned from the Scandinavian countries? On the one hand, my impression is that Norway has done pretty well at dealing with a much as a, a growing and increasingly heterogeneous population, while Denmark hasn't. Uh, is there uh, something right? I, I mean, I wish personally that I was more familiar with the case, and it may be instructive to me on uh, what they've been able to do there. I mean, at one point, uh, I thought. Uh, South Africa uh, was really going to be uh, the, the exemplar. And there was likewise there at one point, a strong scholarly discourse about being post-racial. Uh, that, uh, you know, to put it colloquially as some do, uh, if you were uh, on Robben Island with Nelson Mandela, your chances of becoming a, a billionaire were pretty good you were incorporated right into the corporate elite in terms of board placements and uh, executive uh, positions so that South Africa to a remarkable degree integrated its class elite. Um, at the same time, however, the bottom of that society remains black African. And as those of you who've ever flown into uh, Cape Town know, there's nearly a, a 2 million person shanty town just outside the airport there uh, amidst this otherwise uh, comfortable and, and affluent Cape Town, city of Cape Town. Uh, so there, there are still hurdles to overcome there and, and struggles uh, ahead as inequality intensifies there um, as well. But I'd be interested to, to know more about uh, the, the Norway case and, and other uh, situations. If if it, if it is the case, especially that they maintain fairly flexible and, and forgiving immigration laws and, and who's allowed to, to enter and say, become a citizen and draw on social benefits, that would be really interesting. Uh, George Rode makes the following observation and I don't know whether it's correct or not, but he says, I read that about 10% of US marriages are now interracial. What role, if any, do you think this trend may play as we move forward? 
Yes, um, that, and you know, if, if if I had the fullness of time to to uh, talk about it here, um, <clears throat> I was going to say that the the broad positive changes in racial attitudes, the the repudiation of the the principles or ideals of Jim Crow, de jure, and biological racism, uh, are the sort of data that that racial pessimists dismiss. That that's just lip service that Americans have learned to say. Um, the right thing, and surveys tell us nothing about what's really going on on the ground where racism is as alive and well and experienced uh, today as it was 100 years ago or more. Um, and the problem with that is that those broad trends are consistent with a slow but important decline, say, in racial residential segregation and some small increase in the extent to which blacks in particular have contact with whites in residential space with an increase in the number of African-Americans who are in a very comfortable uh, middle-class status, even and some decline in uh, the numbers at the very bottom of the economic order and consistent with, as the question would put it, a rise uh, in the number of uh, mixed marriages. The problem in the past has been <clears throat> that many analysts and scholars, I think, were again, overly exuberant <laughs> about what those data imply, because mm -hmm. there's strong evidence suggesting um, that, for example, uh, uh, the one drop rule, uh, the, the rule of hypo descent in the US remains a powerful influence that children of mixed race units are most likely to be read still as black, a country that at one point largely read any black ancestry as making one black. Uh, but the rise in uh, mixed race marriages uh, is one sign in and of itself of growing liberalization. And it's one of the things that I think um, uh, is portentous for the future. Um, Howard Gardner raises the following interesting question. Uh, populists and autocrats have been on the rise around the world. To what extent do you think the demographic and cultural differences within those nations are similar to or fundamentally different from what we have been observing in the post-Obama period in the U.S.? You know, I, I wish I had uh, greater familiarity with a, a wide swath of what's going on in other European countries. But I, I will say that in particular, those countries that were um, colonial powers and that had at some point either assured or implied that their colonial subjects would have access to the metropole at some place as, as residents or citizens, that that is indeed part of what has occasioned a fierce debate over who should have access to generous social provision, uh, which often exists uh, in many of these countries, and that the clamoring for a greater share of the pie, as we see just millions upon millions of people uh, either cast into refugee status or, or fleeing um, great economic and material hardship uh, in, in Latin America, in Africa, in, in other parts of, of the world in search of, of better lives are putting pressure on all these more uh, affluent nations and their resources. And I think a lot, not necessarily all, but a lot of, of uh, the kind of rightward movement uh, that, that we see is indeed a reaction against that growing diversity again in the midst of deepening economic anxiety and worry about both individuals' positions within a national economic order and the nation's position uh, within the world order. Uh, uh, and so I do think I see strong parallels without being so uh, glib or, or nonchalant as to say, yes, indeed, it's, it's all the same. Nina Jablonski asks, and this will be the second to the last question because our time is running a bit long. Uh, many people hope that the era of laissez-faire racism would have been ended or actively countered by President Obama. This didn't happen, or at least not to any great extent, except by his, except by his example in the office. In light of where we are now, what concrete steps 
could the new occupants of the executive branch undertake in the coming years to help steer our country onto a new road of racial equality and true equal opportunity? A terrific question and unambiguously a real challenge. Uh, to his good credit, Obama tried to tell folks that they needed to remain mobilized, that really his only prospect for making change hinged on there being an engaged, active voting citizenry uh, who was backing his agenda. You know, I think he was fond of, of quoting FDR when dealing with those who were pushing him to adopt more and more aggressive social legislation um, uh, in response to the depression in the, in the New Deal era, he would say, great, now go out there and make me do it. Uh, so it's not, it's not really on Obama from my vantage point, but uh, on many other political actors and, and leaders. And here I'll confess some personally, some real disappointment with many of his critics um, among uh, especially uh, African-American uh, uh, elites and commentators who I think were just unfairly uh, aggressive in their attacks on Obama at a time when many of his deepest opponents just literally wanted negative noise around him to make it harder for him to govern and to accomplish parts of his agenda. There are other issues here that matter like having 60 Democratic senators when a fair number of them were in effect closet Republicans who were vulnerable to being quickly replaced depending on how they voted on any piece of legislation were an issue. The difficulty of maintaining mobilization uh, in a midterm uh, election when it's not you know, a presidential candidate uh, on, on the ballot at stake uh, was, was yet another issue. And the kind of overwhelming um, uh, economic support that folks like the Koch brothers provided to the creation of the Tea Party um, uh, in that moment. These are all elements of the, the counter mobilization that was going on. And I just, you know, uh, if I blame Obama for anything in this era, it's, it's kind of twofold. Not being the kind of politician who loved being in the struggle himself, constantly articulating the message, pressing the flesh, he was more professorial, give a speech, lay out the agenda, uh, let, let others um, uh, carry forward the work. And secondly, he did play into uh, allowing many of his supporters to understand him less as a politician and more as almost a social movement figure, that it was going to be in and of itself a revolutionary transformation, not a step towards the difficult work of governing in a complex democratic system, but I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> he did okay. the best he could in my estimation. The last question that, that I can offer uh, before we uh, leave tonight is from uh, our, our, uh, our conservator, uh, Renee Walcott. She says, Ibram X. Kendi holds that racist ideas are a response to and justification of discriminatory policies from slavery to redlining to an unbalanced criminal justice system. Do the data you observe support that hypothesis? Does changing the policies result in a change in attitude among white people? Um, it's a complicated question to answer. And I guess to, to quickly, what I would say is, in one sense, yes, institutional arrangements reflected in law policy uh, recurring practice do tend to breed rationalizations. That is, create the ideas that tend to justify what's just been done or created. Uh, however, once those ideas have been created, they exert extraordinary force on channeling what happens from that moment forward. So uh, it's, it, it, it borders on being not very constructive to say all we have to do is change the policy. Changing the policy is a political act that will, will require moving hearts and minds to obtain. So that is why wrestling with the cultural problem, the psychological problem, the attitudinal problem has to be part of uh, any agenda uh, for positive racial change. On that note, I will call this evening's uh, uh, occasion to, uh, to a close. 
Uh, I know there are a lot of uh, qu uh, questions that, that uh, we have not been able to answer tonight, and I will share those with uh, Professor Bobo, and he may be able to respond to at least to some of them uh, in, in writing, and we will, uh, and if so, we will post those on our website. Uh, but in closing, I would like to thank Professor Bobo uh, most heartily for this uh, really wonderful fact-filled uh, account. <laughs> Uh, of of our failure to heal the racial divides that have plagued this country for so long.